Our text for this morning is Micah 7, Micah 7, verses 1 through 7. Micah 7 and 1, Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman, of your punishment has come. Now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor, have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her brother-in-law. The man's enemies are the men of his own house. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands firm and sure forevermore. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, this morning we come to the seventh and the final chapter of the book of Micah. And as we do, we're reminded that in comparison to the 66 chapters of Micah's contemporary Isaiah. This is a relatively short prophecy, and you may recall that the relative brevity of this book is the reason why Micah is sometimes referred to as being budget Isaiah. Here is the thing, though, the relative compactness of Micah's prophecy. It can cause us to forget that while the book of Micah may be short, the days of his ministry were not. And something of the length, something of the longevity of Micah's ministry is revealed to us in the opening verse of this prophecy. There in chapter 1, verse 1, we're told that Micah labored during the reigns of three of Judah's kings. He labored during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Now, the Scriptures testify that during those days, there was a steady decline in the spiritual health of God's people. The chronicler, for instance, tells us that even though Jotham was a faithful king, he was a faithful king who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, that nevertheless, the the people, the people continued to debase themselves by worshiping the gods of their neighbors. Things then took a precipitous downturn during the reign of King Ahaz. Ahaz, who who not only worshipped false gods, but who actually offered up his sons as sacrifices to them. Ahaz, who went so far, we're told by the chronicler, as to seal up, to board up the doors of the temple. The chronicler tells us that the idolatry into which Ahaz entered, that it It brought about not only his ruin, but the ruin of all of Israel. And then there's Hezekiah. Now, by God's grace, Hezekiah was a faithful king. He was a faithful king who repented from sin and who walked in the ways of his father David. Though it must be said that that the lure of material wealth seems also to have touched Hezekiah's heart. We're told by the chronicler that Hezekiah amassed great riches And in his pride, Hezekiah opened the doors of his city, he opened the doors of his treasury, he even opened the doors of the temple to the Babylonian spies who had come to make an assessment of the wealth and the power of the kingdom of Judah. The overall tenor of these days then 
was of a steadily increasing apostasy and of a deepening hardness of heart amongst God's people. And that was especially true. It was especially true of Judah's civic and religious leaders. And it's clear that in those circumstances, even a faithful king, even a faithful king like Jotham and Hezekiah, even they had not been able to fundamentally turn, to fundamentally reorient the hearts of God's people. Now, it's impossible to be absolutely certain, absolutely precise about these things, but given the time frame that's set out for us in chapter 1, verse 1, we can reasonably estimate that the time of Micah's active ministry, that it must have lasted for, for a minimum of 35 years. 35 years of appealing to God's people. 35 years of crying out to them on behalf of the Lord. And what was it that had happened? What had occurred during those 35 years? Well, throughout them all, Micah had cried out to God's people. And he declared to them that, that their refusal to be wholly dedicated to the Lord, their refusal to turn their hearts away from idols and back to him, that that refusal had aroused the righteous indignation of the king of heaven. And Micah hadn't just cried out to them, he'd also pleaded with them. Time and again, he had set before the people the evidence of God's care and provision. And he prevailed upon them. He prevailed upon them to be moved in their hearts by, by those expressions of fatherly care and affection. And Micah had also warned them. He'd warned them that unless they repented, unless they sought the Lord, that, that he would come against them. That his anger would proceed against them, that it wouldn't be restrained, that he would come against them in wrath and judgment. And during those long years, the people of Judah had seen that judgment. They'd seen that judgment when it had been poured out upon the northern kingdom of Israel. And that judgment had come in the form of the Assyrians who had totally devastated that land who'd ripped Samaria down to its foundations, who'd gathered up the people, and who carted them off into exile in a foreign land. And Judah had been touched. They'd been touched by the enormity of that judgment because after laying waste to Israel, those same Assyrian armies had marched right up to the very gates of Jerusalem. And that city had only been spared by, by divine intervention. When God had scattered the Assyrian hosts and when he'd sent them packing, driving them out of the land of Judah, sending them back on the very north road on which they'd come in. For 35 years then, for 35 years in word and in deed, the people of God had borne witness to God's covenant faithfulness. And they'd borne witness to that faithfulness as God had revealed himself to them. And he'd revealed himself as a holy God. He revealed himself as a holy God who demanded the undivided devotion of their hearts. But he'd also revealed himself as a merciful God. As a merciful God who unfailingly showed grace to whomever would turn towards him. And now... Now at the beginning of chapter 7, we listen as Micah, after decades of devoted ministry, as Micah assesses his circumstances, and as he evaluates the spiritual condition of God's people. And that's not a surprising thing for Micah to have done. It's perfectly understandable, I think, that, that after a lifetime of ministry, that, that Micah would want to pause for a moment, that he would want to take stock of things. And we can understand how, how a seasoned pastor who had faithfully shepherded his flock, how he would want to see if his labors had borne fruit. So what is it that Micah discovered? What is it that he found when he looked out on the world around him? What did Micah's spiritual diagnostic about the hearts of God's covenant people, what did it reveal? Well, the opening verse of this chapter makes it clear that the results were anything but encouraging. In fact, far from being encouraged, Micah, Micah is utterly heartbroken. 
and his heartbroken state, his, his grief-filled state, it bursts forth. It bursts forth from him in an anguished cry. It's an anguished cry of, of desolation that's, that's almost Job-like in its despair. As Micah, after having surveyed the, the spiritual condition of, of Israel, of Judah, all he can do is declare, woe, woe is me. And the reason that Micah's cry is anguished is because try as he might, he hadn't been able to find any evidence of fruit in the lives of God's people. Even though Micah had looked high and low, even though he had, he'd gone into the garden, gone into the vineyard, and, and he turned over every leaf, so to speak, the fruits of righteousness and holiness, they were completely absent from the lives of those to whom he had ministered for all of those many years. And so here, here in these words, Micah mourns. He mourns. He mourns because as he looks out at the world around him, what Micah sees is a people who have hit spiritual rock bottom. Now, the good news about this situation is that when you've hit rock bottom, you've got nowhere to look but up. And so the spiritual desolation of his time, it wasn't the only thing that Micah saw. No, the reality is as he looked up. As he looked up to the heavens and, and as he looked to the heavens where the Almighty God sought sovereign, sovereignly enthroned in grace and in power, as he looked up to the heavens, Micah knew hope. And the good news of the gospel is that the very same hope that Micah knew in his circumstances, that is a hope which we can also know. It's a hope that we can also enjoy and benefit from in our own day. And so in that confidence, this morning what we're going to do is we're going to consider the view from rock bottom. And as we consider the view from rock bottom, we'll use these two thoughts to guide us and to organize us this morning. We're going to consider, first of all, the reason for the prophet's mournful cry. The reason for the prophet's mournful cry. And the second thing we'll think about is the reason for the prophet's hopeful gaze. So we'll consider the view from rock bottom, and we'll begin with the reason for the prophet's mournful cry. Now, brothers and sisters, this isn't going to be easy. It's going to mean confronting the harsh realities of a world that has truly hit spiritual rock bottom. And loved ones, that's the, the tough part about dealing with this passage. There's, there's just no way for us to get to the glory that's expressed in verse 7 if we don't first make our way through the spiritual wasteland of verses 1 through 6. So how then does Micah describe things? As he looks out on the society of Judah at that time, how does Micah describe, how does he characterize the view from rock bottom? Well, as we've already noted, Micah compares Jerusalem, he compares the kingdom of Judah to a vineyard in which no fruit can be found. In fact, the picture he paints is of a vineyard where there's not a single grape that remains hanging on the vine. And as we think about this imagery of a, of a barren vineyard, we need to do so in light of the provisions that God had made for the poor. Those provisions for the poor that God had established as part of the Old Testament law. And here we can be helped when we call to mind our study of the book of Ruth from some years ago. And we can remember Ruth, and we can remember how Ruth provided for herself and how she provided for Naomi by following behind the harvesters, and by gleaning in the fields. She gleaned the, the sheaves of barley, or she gleaned the, the pieces of barley that had, had fallen out from the sheaves that were being gathered from the harvesters. And we remember from our study of Ruth that, that God had been quite explicit. He'd been quite explicit about this when he had decreed that not only did the poor have the right to glean in the fields, but God was quite specific that the harvesters were only allowed to make one pass. They were only allowed to make one pass through the fields. And God institutes this to ensure that there would be gleanings, that there would be things that were, were left in the field for the poor to find. God does this in order to ensure that they would be able to, to find sustenance for themselves. 
What Micah describes, however, is a field that has been stripped completely bare. And so what he depicts is a situation in which he has gone looking for spiritual fruit. He's gone looking to find spiritual fruit in Israel, and he's gone looking with that that same sense of urgency and that same sense of need that a poor person would have had when they went looking for food in a field. More than that, however, Micah has come. He's come to that field with the same confidence that a poor person would have come which is to say that he'd come looking for fruit with the confidence that he would find food precisely because God's people would have held to his laws. And therefore, there would be gleanings. There would be something to find in the field. But Micah's hopes are completely dashed because what he discovered was a field that had actually been stripped completely bare. What he finds is a field where the harvesters have been so thorough in their harvesting that there isn't even a single grape. There's not a single fig that has been left to maintain the needs of the poor. What he discovers is a field that's been stripped bare by harvesters who had no love for the poor and by harvesters who had no care and who had no concern for the laws of the Lord. And we're reminded here of of how throughout this book, Micah's words had so often been directed. They'd been specifically directed to the ruling class, to the elite class of Jewish society. And we're reminded how he had exposed their oppression, how he had exposed their exploitation, how they had been willing to take advantage of and to exploit even their brothers and sisters. Well, here in verse 1, Micah laments the fact that after years of calling these folks to repentance, that their wickedness has actually only increased. And it's increased as they have continued to seek after their own wealth and after their own security. Now, what we can't lose sight of is the fact that as as palpable as Micah's personal grief here is in this opening verse, as much it is as it's Micah who cries out here, woe is me, it is not his personal assessment of the situation that's really what's important. And that's because even here in these intensely personal verses, we can't lose sight of the fact that Micah continues to operate. He continues to function as a prophet of the Lord. And so the true tragedy isn't that Micah's heart has been broken after 35 years of apparently fruitless ministry. No, the true tragedy here is that God's heart has been broken by the continual rebellion and hard-heartedness of his people. And brothers and sisters, that's why it was so important for us to take a moment this morning to read from Isaiah. We had to read from Isaiah 5 in preparation for our consideration of this text, because in Isaiah 5, we're reminded that this vineyard about which we're speaking, this vineyard is the people of Judah, and this is a vineyard that God himself has planted. This is a vineyard that God himself has lovingly tended to. And so ultimately, it's the Lord's grief. It's his grief that's being expressed here as he comes to see if there's any fruit to be found in the vines. And he's the one whose heart has been broken. He's the one whose heart has been broken when he discovers that despite everything that he has done, All of the labor that he undertook to ensure ensure that there would be growth in that vineyard, everything that he had done, watering it, fertilizing it, fencing it in, pruning it, all the work that he had undertaken, that it had been been fruitless. And that what he discovered was a, a vineyard that had been left barren. A vineyard left barren by workers who had no care for his people and who had no concern for his joy. And that, loved ones, that is the true heartbreak. That is the true grief of these verses. And as we think about this verse, 
we're reminded here about the function of, of chapters 6 and 7 in this book. We've noted in an earlier sermon how these chapters, how they serve as a, as a rising crescendo to the book. And in these chapters, we experience the, the wondrous revelation of God's own heart. Here God opens his heart to his people. And he, he invites them to gaze into his very own heart and to see who he is. And here we see how his heart has been broken, though he has longed to be in communion with his people, though he's desired nothing more than for them to know him and for them to adore him as their father. Their hearts haven't been swayed. They haven't been moved. They haven't been convicted by, by either the revelation of his holiness or the revelation of his affection. In fact, the hearts of his people have only further turned against him as they've committed themselves to walking in the ways of their own wisdom and to walking in the ways of their own understanding. Now, if that is what Micah, and more importantly, the Lord, found as they looked out from rock bottom and as they surveyed the hearts of God's people, the following verses describe the reasons for this sorrowful state of affairs. So why was it that Judah, why was it that, that when Micah makes his assessment of their spiritual estate, that the only thing he can describe them as is a barren vineyard? Why was that the case? Well, it was because the people of God had forsaken righteousness. It was because they had abandoned the Lord and his laws. God's covenant people weren't being guided by his statutes anymore. Instead, they were being being guided by a different law. Now, here's the thing, brothers and sisters. There's something that we need to understand about, about the lie that Satan tells us when he lays before us the temptation to reject the law of God. What Satan tells us is that if we reject God's law, if we reject his statutes, and if we, we walk in the way of our own understanding, that what we're going to find is true freedom. Freedom from restraint, freedom from any kind of boundary that we're in effect going to be limitless. But here's the truth. When you abandon God's law, you don't actually abandon law altogether. What you do is you just exchange one legal code for another. And what you'll discover is that instead of being governed by a law of liberty, Instead of being governed by a law of righteousness and justice, you're actually going to be governed by a law of slavery, and you're going to be governed by a law of iniquity. Now, I tried to think of a way to, to explain this, of an analogy that I could use, and it, it uh, moves me to tell you about another YouTube rabbit hole that I went down some years ago. I know I do this from time to time. It's the ADHD brain. Here's the thing. Some years ago, I went down a bit of a YouTube rabbit hole that dealt with, I don't know why, but I went down this YouTube rabbit hole that dealt with the question of, of biker gangs. And I was interested in the question of why people would join a motorcycle club, say a motorcycle club like the Hells Angels. Now, what's fascinating is what I discovered when I was down that rabbit hole. These clubs, these organizations, they promise freedom they promise that you will be able to reject the laws and the constraints and the, and the morals of society and that you'll be able to live a free life, a free life that you get to lead on your own terms. But what people discover when they join these clubs is that, in fact, they've just exchanged one legal code for another. Because what they discover is that these motorcycle clubs, that, that they actually have a strict set of rules and guidelines that they demand absolute adherence to. And so the irony of these clubs is that you join to find freedom as you ride down the open road with your hair in the wind, not caring about the laws of men. And yet, when you join this organization, every aspect of your life suddenly becomes rigidly prescribed. You're told what to wear. You're told what kind of motorcycle you can own. You're told how big the engine on your motorcycle can be. You're told where to put the patches on your, on your vests that you wear. 
There's a hierarchy in these clubs, a very rigid hierarchy where people move from the bottom and they slowly move to the top and there are very clear job descriptions for every rung in that hierarchy. The extraordinary thing is that I imagine that the law code for a club like the Hells Angels is even more rigid and structured and organized than the, than the law codes that they claim to have rejected. They've gone seeking freedom, but the reality is all they've done is exchanged one legal code for another. And they've abandoned laws based on the righteousness of God's covenant law, and they've embraced laws of slavery and laws of iniquity. Now, why do I tell you that analogy? Because these are precisely the same circumstances that Micah describes in verses 2 to 4a. What does Micah lay out for us here? The righteous, says Micah, they vanished from society and there is no one who delights in, there is no one who promotes the standards of God's law. And because of that, instead of seeking after their neighbor's welfare, says Micah, they actually seek after their neighbor's downfall. They actively and intentionally plot the destruction and the harm of their neighbor. And they are, says Micah, dedicated to this cause. And in their dedication, they have become organized. They've become structured. They have, he says, become very skilled at oppressing and exploiting their neighbors. Micah says that they do this with the work of their hands. And the image that Micah is relying on here is actually the image of someone who is an ambidextrous soldier. It's the image of someone who is actually able to draw a sword and to fight with both hands. This is how good they are, says Micah. It's how structured and deliberate and skilled they are in the ways of righteousness. And consequently, says Micah, they're very dangerous foes. And crucially, says Micah, it is the leaders who have led the way in this iniquity. He says that it is the prince and the judges, it is the leaders of society who are the ones who are demanding a bribe. And that helps to explain why Micah so, is so comprehensive in his declaration when he says that the righteous have completely disappeared from the land. What Micah is saying when he says that the righteous are completely gone and, and that there's no one left in the land who does good, what he's saying is that iniquity and unrighteousness, they have a trickle-down effect. If the leaders of a society dedicate themselves towards bribery and iniquity, when they become a law seeking only their own good, what happens is that that trickles down to the rest of society. And those below them are now forced to operate in that same framework if they're going to survive. And that helps us understand why Micah says at the end of verse 3 that it is the prince and the judge, that it is these leaders in society. It is them who have led the way in iniquity. And what does Micah say? He says, the great man expresses the desires of his heart. These leaders, they've made no secret of what their goals are. They've made no secret of what their desires are. They've made it clear that they are only interested in seeking after their personal pleasure and power. And the remainder of society has taken their cue from them and followed after them in the same pursuits. And the results, says Micah, have been the emergence of an entire social structure in which the people, he says, conspire together, in which they work together to achieve those very same ends. But what is remarkable about this situation is that because each of these individuals has now become wholly dedicated to seeking after their own personal satisfaction, in the irony of this situation is that they actually can't even successfully work together and their collective efforts are blunted by the fact, says Micah, that they have become thorn bushes. They become hedges and briars. What does Micah mean by that? What he means is that these people are so dedicated to the pursuit of their own pleasure and power and interests that they actually pierce each other. They entangle each other. They limit each other as they fight to get their share of the pie, so to speak. 
And I do want to pause here just for a moment, brothers and sisters, and sometimes we find in Scripture, we find incredible comfort in the most surprising of places. One of the things that we learn in the book of Proverbs is the wonderful phrase that evil shall slay the wicked. Evil shall slay the wicked. The wicked, says the teacher, will bring about their own destruction. Well, why is that? Well, because working together to achieve some kind of higher purpose or communal goal, it ultimately requires self-sacrifice. And the unregenerate man isn't capable of self-sacrificing. The unregenerate man is only capable of seeking after himself. And so he will always seek his own advancement and safety. And so the wicked will always turn on each other. They will always turn on each other and they will always tear themselves apart. And I say this as a comfort to you because from time to time, fears arise in our world. Fears arise in our world about political leaders who may come together to form cabals And those cabals may be economic, those cabals may be global, they may be social, they may be moral. We sometimes live in fear of the plots and the schemes of the wicked. We see how they've organized themselves, how they're open about what their aims are, and we're afraid. But here we're reminded by Micah that that the wicked are just thorn bushes, they're just hedges. They'll pierce themselves, they'll entangle themselves in their own quest for their own self-advancement and glory, they'll just tear themselves apart. And so we find a rich comfort here. So if this is what things look like, if Judah is a barren vineyard, and if things are the way they are because the people of God had refused to humble themselves before the Lord, they refused to turn from their iniquity and follow Him, then what are the consequences What are the consequences going to be of of having closed their ears and having hardened their hearts? Well, that's a question that Micah answers for us at the end of verse 4. There at the end of verse 4, Micah tells us that as a consequence of their refusal to turn their hearts towards the Lord, that judgment has come upon them. Now, we might pause here for a moment and we might think to ourselves, well, wait a minute, Micah, we know our Old Testament history And you seem to be a little bit ahead of the game here. You've declared that judgment is going to come upon the people of Judah, but we know that that judgment isn't going to come for another hundred years yet. We know that because we've read the book of Jeremiah, and we know that it's going to be roughly a century before the Babylonians show up and before what has been prophesied earlier in Micah, that that Jerusalem is going to be plowed like a field. We know that that's not going to happen for another century or so. And so how can you say here in these verses that, that already now judgment has come? Well, the key to answering that question is to focus for a moment on what Micah says in the very last line of verse 4. And there he declares... Now their confusion is at hand. Now their confusion is at hand. Now what does Micah mean by that? Well, what Micah is saying is that the day of judgment has come insofar as after many long years of crying out to his people through the voices of prophets like Micah, And after long years of faithfully and lovingly tending his vineyard in the hope of finding fruit, that God has now decided to withdraw his hand of blessing. He's going to pull back that hand of blessing from his people, and instead he's going to give them over. And what is it that he's going to give them over to? Well, he's going to give them over to the desires of their own hearts. What Micah is saying here is that if it is iniquity that the people desire, then it's iniquity that they're going to get. And so the judgment that Micah speaks of here is God's decision to give them over to themselves and to the desires of their own hearts. And let me ask you a question. What is it that happens? What is it that happens when people reject God and when they turn from His ways? What happens when men forsake the wisdom of God and they decide to walk in the way of their own understanding? Well, what happens is that they become confused. And in that confusion, they enter into madness and they enter into despair. 
And in that madness and despair, what we find is that the very fabric of their society, it begins to fray and it begins to pull apart. And that's precisely what Micah prophesies will happen in verses 5 and 6. Because what Micah says is that in a world where righteousness has been scorned, in a world where every man, to use a phrase from Judges, does what is right in his own eyes, then the very fabric of that society will begin to break down. And the breakdown of that society will extend, says Micah, even into the home. It's going to extend into the most basic structures of our human relationships. We're going to see, says Micah, that that when men are given over to themselves, that the very fabric of their community begins to break down. And the point here, brothers and sisters, is that in a society that lives under the judgment of God, a judgment that is imposed on them for rejecting His call to seek Him and to walk in His ways, In such a society, then confusion will reign. And in that confusion, people are going to live in isolation. They're going to live in fear. They're going to live in darkness as they discover that they have simply exchanged one law for another. And that they've exchanged the law of righteousness and freedom for a law of slavery and iniquity. And it is precisely for these reasons that the Lord Jesus quotes these words in Matthew 10. What was Jesus trying to do there in Matthew 10? Well, what he was trying to do was to prepare his disciples, to prepare his people to live in a world that was also under God's judgment. What Jesus is saying is, look, you're living in the last days. You're living in a world that is under the hand of God's judgment. You need to know what that's going to be like. And you need to be ready for that. Now, there is a difference between the context in which Micah ministered and the context in which Jesus ministered. When Micah spoke and when Micah prophesied, he cried out to a people who had fallen under God's judgment because of their hard-hearted refusal to be obedient to the commands of the covenant. Micah is crying out to a covenant people. He's saying to them, Judgment has come upon you. Confusion has come upon you because you won't turn your hearts to God. Because the fruits of righteousness are absent despite all of God's efforts. You are not living according to the standards of God's covenant law. But Jesus, Jesus spoke and ministered in a world that steadfastly refuses to be obedient to what? What we learned about the last time when we studied the catechism a world that steadfastly refuses to be obedient to the command to believe the gospel. A world that steadfastly refuses to be obedient to the command to believe the gospel. And the point that Jesus makes in Matthew is that it is the gospel that will, it, is, it will be people's response to the gospel. It will be people's response to the gospel message that he is the Messiah sent to redeem the world from sin by his atoning death on the cross It will be people's response to that message that will become the source of division. It's people's response to that message that will become the source of judgment in a world that would emerge after his ascension. And so Jesus prepares his disciples. He prepares his disciples for the reality of living in that world. They will, as he says elsewhere, they're going to be like wheat that is sown amongst the weeds. And the separation of the fruit of the harvest from the weeds, says Jesus, it's not going to take place until the very last day of judgment. But in those intervening years, in those intervening years between his ascension and his return, his children shouldn't be surprised at the fact that their choice to follow him, that their choice to cling to righteousness, that it is going to cause division and that it's going to cause hatred And that this division and that this hatred and that this pain, it will extend even into their own households. It will extend even into their most intimate and familial relationships. You're going to be living in a world that is under judgment, says Jesus. And that judgment will be the very same judgment, the very same judgment that fell upon Judah in the days of Micah 
Men, says Jesus, are going to be given over to what? They're going to be given over to the lusts of their hearts. And consequently, confusion is going to reign. And it's going to continue to be so until the prophesied day of judgment arrives. And brothers and sisters, isn't it the case that we see that? Isn't it the case that we see that as we look out on our society? Surely we realize that we live in a society that is profoundly confused. We look out on a society where babies are torn apart in the womb by people who claim to be upholding human rights. We look out on a society that believes that the best way to promote good social health is to kill off anyone whose life has become too burdensome for them or for the rest of us. We're surrounded by a society where children are legally divorcing their parents. We're surrounded by a society where despite the enormous consequences to to mental health, to physical health, to relationship health, that sexual promiscuity of all kinds is hailed and praised as, as the highest achievement of human liberty. We look out on a society where even the most basic categories of human existence The categories of being male and female, these things have become so erased. They're so erased that I read a number of weeks ago that the OPP has decided that they're not going to announce the gender of missing persons. I mean, think your way through that one for a minute. If I'm kidnapped, you can tell people my social security number. I don't care, right? Get me back. And the OPP is like, we will not infringe on human rights by telling the gender of people who are missing. This is the confusion of the world that we live in. And when we are so bold as to suggest that maybe, just maybe the confusion is a self-destructive cycle that could be broken if people just turned to the Lord and walked in the ways of his will, then we are attacked and we are maligned as knuckle-dragging troglodytes who are the enemies of human freedom and progress. And when we tell people that Jesus is the fullest expression of God's love for sinners, and that there is a way to be reconciled with this holy God who has made them, and to live with him in peace and prosperity, then we are told that we are ignorant bigots who hate rather than love our neighbor. Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, that we should not be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised by these circumstances because this is simply the expected reality of living in a world that even now exists under the hand of God's judgment. Well, that is a pretty grim picture. It's a pretty grim picture, isn't it? It's a grim picture of, of Micah's day, and it's a grim picture of our own. But the blessed good news is that this is not where Micah stops. And Micah goes on to make a bold declaration of faith. A bold declaration about faith and the hope that the righteous have as they live in this world. And we find that declaration made for us in verse 7, where we hear the reason for the prophet's hopeful gaze. And the important thing here is that as he expresses the view from rock bottom, Micah doesn't just look out. Micah doesn't just look out to see what's happening in the world around him. No, Micah also looked up. And when he looked up from rock bottom, he found a rich and abiding comfort. Because when he looked up, he saw the Lord. And he saw the Lord seated in sovereign glory. And he saw the Lord ruling in justice. And he saw the Lord ruling in equity over the nations. This is what Micah had called the people of the world to see in chapter 1 and 2, right? That first part of the score, that first movement, that building crescendo, what does Micah say? He cries out to the people of the nations about the power and about the sovereignty of God and about his rule. And Micah looks up and he, he sees God seated in the heavens, ruling in justice and equity. And Micah knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord, who had proven himself faithful when it came to imposing the covenant curses of judgment upon his people, that he would also prove faithful in upholding his covenant promises to his people. 
And Micah knew what God had promised. He knew that God had promised that he would never utterly cut off his people. He knew that he would never totally abandon them. Micah knew that God would redeem for himself a remnant, a remnant of the righteous who even amidst all of that confusion, even amidst that barren vineyard who had nevertheless clung to him in faith and in truth. We can think of Elijah here, right? Elijah who says, I and I alone am left. And God says, no, there are 7,000 faithful. Micah says, woe is me. There's not a righteous man left in the world, but we know that God is faithful to his promises. And so Micah, like Elijah, has to learn. He has to understand that, that there is a way of hope, and Micah confesses that hope here in this verse. And here Micah declares that he would put his hope in the sure and certain promises of the Lord. And having done so, that he would wait upon him. That he would wait patiently in faith. Because here's the thing about Micah. Micah didn't know how this was going to play out. He knew, even at that time, that God would be faithful. He knew that God would save a remnant. He knew that God would redeem a people. But he didn't know how. He didn't know the way in which that story would be finished. He just trusted that God's people would never be forsaken by the God in whom he had put his faith and the God whom he had served all these many years. And Micah didn't just wait. He also cried out. He called to God. Micah says that at the very end of verse 7. He's confident that God will hear him. And so we know that Micah would have gone to God and that he, he would have spoken to him. That he would have spoken to him about his needs, that he would have spoken to him about his fears, but that he also would have called the Lord to faithfulness to his own promises. And Micah knew that God wouldn't be deaf to those cries. Loved ones, the good news of the gospel is that Micah's hope is our hope. And it's our hope even as we look out at the confusion of a world that is held so firmly in the grip of a powerful delusion. The people around us are so, so deeply committed to the lie that the lives they are leading are good and that they are happy and that they are fruitful. And what they haven't realized yet in the darkness of their own existence, is that they're barren vines. In fact, what they haven't realized is that they're weeds. Weeds that are being gathered up. Weeds that will ultimately be cast into the fire. They're committed to that lie. They work together to pursue that lie. They have become skilled in the art of wickedness. But loved ones, we do not need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to get depressed or worried or fearful about what we see out there. And we will never become afraid if we never fail to look up. Because the same God, the very same God to whom Micah looked, remains seated in heavenly glory. He continues to rule sovereignly over the nations. He continues to be faithful to his promises that not one of his children will be lost along the way. That though they might be sown among the tares, though they might be sown among the weeds, though those weeds at times might threaten to overwhelm them, that he will never lose sight of those who belong to him. And we know that even more certainly than Micah did because we know how God brought about that salvation. We have seen and known and heard of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know not just of what he came to do, but we know of where he is now. We know that he was lifted up from this earth, that he has been installed in the heavens, that he sits at his Father's right hand, and that there he rules, and he has gone to make a place for his people. And we know that he's promised to return in the day of judgment. So what do we do with all of this, brothers and sisters? Well, we need to do two things. First of all, we need to heed the warning. We need to heed the warning to live in holiness and never to turn from the ways of the Lord. Never to believe the lie that sin offers a better path, a freer path. We need to cling to the Lord. and We need to cry out to him that his spirit would work in us the fruits of faith. So that when he comes, he finds us fruitful members of his kingdom. 
But we don't just need to heed the warning, we also need to live in the hope. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what's happening in the world. Don't be afraid if you are dragged before judges or princes or rulers of men. Don't be afraid if you are mocked or maligned. Jesus has promised us that if we lose our life for him, we will find it indeed. Amen.